Hi everyone, and welcome to PyMCCon. My name is Matthijs Brandt, and in this talk, I will discuss how and why we should take time more seriously. But first, a bit about me. I'm the data science lead at Accelerated, and at work, I've been responsible for the learning and development of about, in total, over 50 junior and media data scientists. Um, I really enjoy the PyData community, so I'm actively involved in it as well. I help organize both PyData Amsterdam and PyData Global, which is happening later this year. Um, all of this couldn't happen without the awesome uh, open source community that we're in. Um, and I contribute back to it by maintaining, for example, Scikit-Lego, um, which is a library that contains useful Lego bricks for the Scikit-Learn ecosystem. And I recently started this time series library, which we'll discuss in today's talk. Talking about PyData Global, from the release of this video, um, it's only a couple of days left until that event is happening. Tickets are on sale now, it's pay what you want. We'll have like more than 70 talks, uh, over a dozen tutorials, short talks, etc. But back to why we're actually here though. Um, forecasting is a very common data science task that, that companies need to do. And, and very often if you're a data scientist somewhere, you're bound to run into a problem that says, can we predict how much of unit X we're going to sell in this amount of years or what the demand is for this product in this amount of years? Um, and it turns out that that's actually quite a challenging problem because typically your data isn't super neat, isn't super clean, and there's all these kinds of long-term human effects in there. And for example, a data set that you might encounter could look something like this where we have in total about five products um, over different timescales. So we have a couple of interesting things that we can note about this data set. We see, for example, that there's obviously obvious yearly seasonality, but there also seems to be some kind of weekly seasonality. Um, near the beginning in the red and the blue ones, we have quite a few missing data points, but also there's these bands that we can see where there's some kind of additional promotion or some kind of other very local trend shift or paradigm shift in terms of the value of these time series. Projects or products get discontinued, products get newly introduced, so our time series are basically not really overlapping. And modeling these kinds of time series is difficult. Because if you use classical time series approaches, you'd end up with maybe some kind of Ceremax model to capture like the autoregressive part and the seasonality part. But those kind of models are typically designed for much shorter seasonalities, right? Because how are we going to look at the seat or the value of a year ago if our product just got recently introduced? Um, multiple seasonalities like the yearly and the weekly one that we've discussed are generally not really possible in these kinds of models either, except like if you do some work workarounds. Um, missing data is a, a giant issue, right? You need to impute those or something, otherwise your model will trip up heavily. Same thing with, with outliers. And in actuality, like these are five products, but very often you have many, many more that you want to make predictions for at the same time. And tweaking each individual model for each individual product is a lot of time that you generally don't have. And this is exactly the type of problem that several people at Facebook research faced uh, when they decided to build Profit. So Profit is a time series decomposition model. And it's written in Stan and it basically says, well, rather than trying to capture any kind of autoregressive capacities of this, of this data, what we can also do is try to treat it as a curve fitting exercise. So basically how it works is we have a trend, we have one or more types of seasonalities, we have additional regressors if we need them. And that plus some IID noise is our original series. And all these different components have parameters and that's sort of the goal that we want to, to get. We want to fit those parameters to the best represent our, our original series. Um, and the nice thing about this is that it's like in principle, it's really flexible because if we don't like like one type of seasonality fitting, we can just replace it with another kind. And if we don't like the way that the trend is fitted, we should be able to replace it with another trend. Um, and because it's curve fitting, we don't really care about regularly spaced data. We don't really care about missing data. All those things are handled natively. Um, there are, however, some downsides too. Because first of all, while the 
the, the idea behind the model offers this flexibility, the actual implementation of profit does not. So if we want to change out the seasonality for another way of fitting it, we actually have to go inside the source code and change things there. And the other problem is that it either treats, like the only way we can fit multiple series is by either treating them as being completely different or being completely the same. And if we think back about the data that we, um, that we showed earlier, we kind of see that, well, the seasonalities are probably shared between the different series. Like either it's co-seasonal or contra-seasonal, but the same general seasonal pattern holds. And that's something that we see very often in these kinds of product time series. And we would actually really like to fit those together as well. And those two things combined made me decide to start writing time series to solve both of those issues. Um, I was more familiar with PyMC than I was with Stan, so I decided to build this thing in PyMC. That's also why, why I'm here today. Um, and basically, the first thing that we need to do is, let's see whether we can rebuild profit inside of PyMC. In order to do that, we need to take a look at how are these components actually fitted. So what we'll do is we'll start with the trend, because that's sort of, that's the basis of it. And the paper actually discusses two ways of fitting the trend, um, one with a linear growth and one with a saturating growth. But for now, I'll stick to linear growth because of the time constraints that we have. And the basic idea behind it is that your growth starts at a certain initial growth k. And it's a parameter that we we're going to have to fit. And basically, to allow differences in this trend, we seed the entire space with evenly distributed change points. Those are these S1 to S4 you see on the, on the slides here. Generally, they're evenly distributed, but if you want, you can also set them on specific predefined dates yourself. And the idea now is that these change points, the location of them are, aren't learned, but instead what we learn is the delta at that change point. So at each change point, our growth is allowed to change with a certain delta, and to ensure that it doesn't change all the time or that you don't leak your seasonality inside your trend changes, what we do is we try to enforce sparsity on them by setting a very strong regularizing prior like Laplacian on it. And your entire growth at a certain time then basically boils down to the summation, uh, initial growth plus the sum of all the deltas for all the change points that have passed already at that time t. This Summation is rather annoying to implement and to, to, to do vectorized. So the paper proposes a slightly different notation in which they first define a giant indicator matrix A. And this indicator matrix is basically T time steps long by S time steps wide. And for each time slot, it indicates whether that change point in that column has already passed or not. So it's basically a giant matrix of zeros and ones. And when we multiply that, that, that indicator matrix with our delta matrix and we um, add our initial growth to it, then basically what we get is for each timestamp the growth rate at that time. We can multiply it by t to get sort of the trend value at that time, except that that wouldn't be continuous. So we add a certain offset that's not time dependent, but just change point dependent to make sure we get a nice smooth continuous function out of it. Let's take a look at how these parameters actually work in a bit of a demo. So what I have here is a small streamlit application that I built while I was design while I was building time series as well. And it's basically um, a way in which we can interact with the parameters of the profit components so that we can actually see their effects really well. So what we see here is the same formulation that we just had on the slides, um, the same formulation written down in NumPy, and then the different components graphed below it. So the growth is that first part, the offset is the second part of the chart, and then the trend is the entire thing. If we change our initial growth, this k parameter, we see that the growth line goes slightly up, the offset line stays the same, and our trend is now ever increasing. We can change our M to be some, some kind of negative number. We see the offset decreases, the growth stays the same, the shape of the trend stays the same, but the entire thing is now shifted down. If we now, for example, add a small delta on each individual point, we see that the offset takes form of this step function, and that step function is basically there to offset the step function in the growth so that we have a nice 
like increasingly increasing trend out of this. And you can play around with this a bit, like you can have all kinds of different shapes to have different kinds of trend shapes as well. So let's take a look at what it would take to code up this linear trend part in PyMC3. And let's try to fit it on the series that we discussed earlier. So I'll go to a Jupyter Notebook and I'll start with reading in my data. Um, I've got it in a CSV. I think it's called like time series.csv. Um, and what we want out of that is just one series for the moment. So we'll say series equals, let's pick this summer one series, get the T and the value column out of it. Um, and let's make sure that those are properly set. So for the value, I kind of want to have it scaled. So let's divide it by the max of the value to get it nicely between zero and one. Um, and let's make the time a nice daytime. And if that worked correctly, our data should look something like, whoops, like this. And we can use matplotlib or something to plot this. Let's see. Right, that should be familiar. Okay, so, well, where do we start? Well, of course, by importing pymc3. And we're gonna need Fiano operations as well. So import Fiano.tensor stt. And I like to always start with defining the hyperparameters for this model. So for this linear trend, we had a couple. Um, we, for example, had the number of change points that we wanted to allow inside our trend model. Um, we needed to actually make those change points. So let's do a lint space between zero and the max of T, um, the number of change points plus two so that we can get like anything from the first one to the second to last one. We need to make this T and I'm just gonna make this uh, the length of T divided by the no, sorry, the length of my data frame divided by the length of my data frame to have a nice time between zero and one as well. This is just to make like reasoning about the parameters easier without needing to deal with these kinds of scale differences along the way. Once we have these, we can also make this big indicator matrix. Um, so we can take our time column and basically say, well, wherever our time is bigger than than S, right? That's sort of the idea here. But both of these are like one dimensional in different shapes and we kind of wanted to have a two dimensional thing. So let's add a um, second dimension to our time. And let's multiply this by one to get a nice indicator matrix out. And then it should look like this, which is what we expected because there's thousand time steps, 10 change points. Once we've done this, we can actually get to the modeling part. So we open a, a PyMC model context. And what I always like to do is start from the bottom up on these things. So I'm gonna start with my observed data. And we already said that Profit assumes that our observed data is IID distributed. So we can basically just say, well, it's gonna be normally, like our observations are gonna be normally distributed around some uh, mean that's our trend with some kind of standard deviation, which is the, the error parameter um, and it's observed data um, because it's like our, our value data from our data frame. This error is basically needs to be a strictly positive parameter and what tends to work well there is to put a half Cauchy prior on it. So we're gonna try and fit this parameter. So we need to define like, what is the prior distribution over this parameter. And let's just put it at a reasonably wide um, half Cauchy distribution. For the actual trend, we basically need to re-implement that, that trend formula that we've seen before. And that was something like, um, like the, the trend part here times T plus, um, the, the offset part here. 
So this was the growth, and this was the... Ah, we don't even need the brackets. Growth times t plus offset. And our growth was our initial growth um, plus the dot product between this indicator matrix and our delta. And our offset was our initial offset plus the dot product, once again, between uh, not, not a and delta, a and gamma. And this gamma thing was, um, like, what was it? Minus s, minus s times delta. So we have a couple of things in here that we don't know yet. Um, most importantly, delta, k, and m. And how does it work uh, when we want to estimate those? Well, once again, we basically just define a prior over them. So k can be positive, negative, doesn't really matter. So put a normal prior on it, centered around zero with standard deviation of one. And we'll do something similar for the, the initial offset, but let's make it a bit wider because we, we assume that it can be a wider offset. And for our delta, we wanted the sparsity inducing behavior. So what we do there is we put a, a Laplacian prior on it. And Laplacian prior is very like um, very peaked around zero. So we have a lot of probability mass around zero. So it's gonna be like our posterior is gonna be drawn more towards zero there as well. Um, it's gonna be centered around zero and it can be quite, no, not, that, not that small, that small. Like it can be quite small deltas. Because it's going to multiply by time, so it's like in this, in actuality the, the effect is still quite big. And we don't have one delta; we actually have the number of change points. We have that many deltas. When we give this shape parameter to pi mc, what happens is it basically fits n independent distributions, and we can index them with with square brackets if we need to. Then the only thing that's left is actually to get a posterior trace out of this. So we call pm.sample. Um, let's see, we need maybe like a thousand tune steps, uh, six scores on this machine. So let's put those in six as well. And let's get this one. And through the magic of pre-recorded talks, we don't actually have to wait for the sampling process to be continue, to, to be completed. Um, but what we basically see is that in about three and a half minutes, we have a fully sampled posterior. We don't get any warnings, so that's already a good sign that, that, we have a, um, that we have a decent model and that it's sort of managed to sample from the posterior properly. But it's always good to sort of verify that manually by looking at the trace plot of our trace as well. And once that is loaded, we'll see a couple of things, right? Our, um, our initial growth is like somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5. Um, our initial offset is somewhere between, well, 0.5 and 0.6 basically. And most of our delta seem to have pretty distinct non-zero um, distributions, right? They're, they're, most of them are, are clearly non-zero, which is a bit odd because we put this, this strongly regularizing prior on it, so we kind of expected them to be sparse, um, but it actually makes sense, and we'll take a look at why that is um, right now, actually. Because if we go and plot the um, what came out of this, is we'll, we'll see why that happens. And I've made some plotting utility functions, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put in the means of the parameters, um, Normally you would much rather uh, not do that and you would much rather sample from it, but this was a bit easier to, to set up for now. Um, and we can call this plot trend function that uses the our original DF, our, our trend DF and this, um, this plotting S. And what we see there is that our deltas are actually quite, um, yeah, they're, they're quite large. And we also see that there's actually some kind of periodicity in our deltas. And when we think about it, that makes perfect sense because our model doesn't have a way at the moment to capture any kind of seasonality. The only flexibility that it can have is in its trend. So that's also what we see in our final prediction 
we see like both the trend part. So here's this like this small trend shift, as well as the um, having higher values in in summer. We see both of those reflected in this single trend um, component, and that's not great, right? Because this trend is not really extrapolatable to um, to future times because like nothing inherently says that there has to be periodicity. So we can't extrapolate the periodicity either. So what we're going to have to do is take a look at how we can implement the seasonal components of profit in PyMC3 as well. And let's do that next. For its seasonality, profit uses a Fourier series. And the idea for a Fourier series is basically that given an infinite amount of different frequency cosines and sine functions, we can approximate any function that we just might like. So there's a couple of hyperparameters here, uh, mostly in how many of these cosines and sines functions do we want, um, and what is the periodicity of those cosines and sine functions. And basically what the entire seasonality model then is, is basically learning a weight for each of those differently frequent, different frequency cosine and sine functions and summing them all together. So n is our main complexity hyperparameter. Increasing that makes our seasonality much more wiggly. Um, if you have a lower n, it's, it's a bit smoother. And the profit paper suggests that n equals 10 works well for yearly seasonality, and then n equals 3 works well for weekly seasonality. Um, in my experience, that's a bit, too, um, a bit too complex for most cases, but it's not very far off. So how does it, like, how does it actually look like? I made a small GIF of these for of, of some kind of Fourier seasonality. Here we see our initial cosine multiplied by a weight. Um, we get a sine wave with another weight. Those get added together to form the orange one. We get a higher frequency cosine with a different weight and a higher frequency sine wave with a different weight to in the end end up with this as our total seasonality. So let's go back to Streamlit and look and play around with the parameters and see what this can do. Just like what I did with the um, linear trend, I also added the Fourier seasonality to the Streamlit application. And what we see here in the top chart will be all the individual sine and cosine waves. And in the bottom chart, we see the combined effect of those sine and cosine waves. So we can, we can add some kind of weight times our first, like our base frequency um, cosine. And we see that it, it indeed repeats like one time over a year. If we then add like the double frequency as well, we see that indeed it repeats two times over a single year. And the summed effect becomes some kind of like higher peak, lower peak effect. And like we can add even more and then we have like a flat bit and then a small peak and a bit big peak. And you see that these are kind of like quite flexible ways of, of modeling any kind of repeated periodic effect. Um, although you do get these kind of like these wiggly things, these kind of artifacts from your Fourier seasonality in there quite often, especially once you start increasing the number of components to your of your model. So what does it take to implement this in PyMC? Well, actually, once again, not that much because well, we start again with our hyperparameters, and the main one was this number of components, and then I'll define a helper function that basically generates the base sine and cosines, like the unweighted sine and cosine waves. So this takes uh, the time for which it needs to generate those, the periodicity over which it needs to generate them, um, and the number of components that we want, which I'll put to a year and three components. And then basically what we do is we define the, the sort of the inner part of the cosines and the sines, which was two times np dot pi times mp dot a range of the number of components that we want, uh, plus one, to make sure that it starts at, at one and not at zero. Um, we multiply this with the time again. Once again, we make the time a 2D matrix so that the broadcasting works out and we divide that by our periodicity. What we then return is the concatenated versions of the cosine versions of x and the sine versions of x over axis 1. And this thing we'll use inside our actual PyMC model. Once again, I like to work bottom up 
so we start by changing um, our observations. So because rather than just observing like from the trend onward, we're gonna basically uh, observe our data based off of the predictions. And the predictions are going to be, uh, prediction, sorry. It's just gonna be our trend plus our seasonality. The seasonality is the dot product between this um, vector of unweighted cosines and sines dot product with their with their weights and these weights are the parameters that we want to learn so we define a prior on it um, i just stick with a normal prior here i don't really care about sparsity for it although if you could you might as well change it into uh, laplacian it's not really an issue and we're also because this is a vector we're going to give it a shape which is the number of components times two because we need the sine and the cosine weight independently of each other and now that this is done sampling and we look at our original, like what our, our original plot that shows like what the trend fitted, we see something extremely different because it actually fits quite a bit worse. But that's a good thing in this case, because what has happened is that rather than picking up the seasonality inside the trend, it picks it up, the model picks it up inside the actual seasonality component. And we can plot that as well. So let's make our seasonal data frame, which is our, um, sorry, our seasonal components of our time T um, using the parameters of our, uh, of our beta uh, parameter from our trace. And let's plot the seasonal components. Uh, it's the regular DF and the seasonal DF. Right, and what we clearly see is that the actual seasonality pattern, like the repeating pattern, is picked up very well by this component, so it doesn't need to be fitted by the trend anymore. And that's nice because we can use this one to more easily predict towards the future. future. If we combine both of them, so we plot both the trend DF and our seasonal DF, we see that our final prediction fits our data, well, quite well. Like we see definitely some see some noise around our prediction. In part, that could be because it's just noise, the other part could be that um, that's a weekly seasonal component and we didn't add that to our model yet. And before we actually go and add that and before we actually go and extend this one model to, um, to predict multiple series at a time, I think it's good to think about the API first. Because while this is quite kind of readable, if you start adding more components to this and if you start adding different kinds of things to this, it's gonna get unreadable quite quickly. And this is not the thing that we want to expose to users or to modelers who are actually going to use this for their own time series predictions task. So let's discuss the API. So when I was developing time series, I of course took some inspiration from how other packages do this. Um, so I looked at both like what, what does profit do itself in terms of the API to expose this to end users? Um, what do packages like forecast and R do? What are the differences? What works well? What doesn't work well? And Profit uses a thing called a Fluent API, which means that there is a sort of base object and there's a bunch of methods and you can chain those methods together. So what you see on the left here, there is a monthly seasonality and a yearly seasonality and you just add it with this add seasonality method. Um, and to an end user, that's actually like, it's, it's not bad, um, but there are a couple of things that I don't like about it. And the first of all is that it's, that it's very closed. And this is actually the main cause why it's not very easy to add your own types of components to profit because like you have to actually go in and, and say, oh, I want to add a different kind of seasonality and that needs to be a different method on this profit object. Also, like if we want to have multiplicative seasonality or additive seasonality um, that's multiplied with some kind of other regressor or something, it's very hard to fit into this interface because it only adds these like independent components one at a time. So that's not great about it. So I thought, okay, how does R solve this? Um, and they heavily rely on this, this formula domain specific language that's sort of ubiquitous in a lot of the, the R packages where you basically say, well, Y is distributed according to some kind of trend plus seasonality. And this is already more like it because we could put brackets in there. We could add plus signs and multiplication signs and all the components are actually 
nicely separated. Um, the problem with this approach, though, is that it relies really heavily on the, the non-standard evaluation functionality of R. And Python doesn't really have that. So if we wanted to replicate like a string-based formula, then we're going to have to write our own parser for it. And that, once again, makes it very difficult for other people to just add different kinds of components. So I wanted something that looked like the way the, the forecast package looks in R, but without needing to write any of the parser stuff. So what I settled on um, was a expression tree. Um, and, and that basically makes it possible to make the thing on the right, uh, on, on the R side work. So what we see here are all different kinds of nodes, all of which are time series models. So we have a linear trend, which is a time series model, and we have a Fourier seasonality, which is a time series model. But then this multiplication node is just a multiplicative time series model as well. And it multiplies its left side with its right side. And the same thing for this plus node here, that's an additive time series module model, which, mo which adds its left side plus its right side. And by making these into separate classes that adhere to the same API uh, with some overloaded methods, it turns out that you can really elegantly write down some kind of API for this time series uh, problem. Um, I'd like to start with a bit of a simpler example though, and we'll retrofit this to our uh, PyMC model afterwards. So I basically, just to illustrate the point, I made, um, I made this API just for regular computations of numbers. So everything in this API is a node, and there are three types of nodes, namely numbers, add nodes, and multiplication nodes. And when you do the dunder add on a node object or dunder mole on a node object, it basically uses, it, it returns a new add node with self and other. So this dunder add, by the way, for people who don't know, this is what gets called if you use the plus sign on an object in Python. Uh, if it's not like a, a built-in thing, then it just refers to the dunder add of the object. And same for the dunder mo. So what is a number then? Well, a number needs to be initialized with some kind of value, which is just a, a number, number n, for example. And when we ask for what the value of the node, the, this number node is, we just return that it's the self.n that we stored. Um, our add nodes and our mole nodes are initialized slightly differently because they take a left side and a right side. And whenever we ask for the value of an add node, it goes and looks what is the value of my left side and what is the value of my right side and add them together. Same thing for a multiplication node, but then multiply them together. And that means we can write our computations down like this on the right side. So we have a number five plus six plus seven times eight. And because operators just follow like regular operator precedence rules, this basically turns into um, seven times eight plus five plus six, which is 67. But because the Python parser just like does these things in order, we can also put brackets whenever we want. So we can also say, please add five, six, and seven together, and then multiply them by eight to get the result 144 if we ask for their value. And this same principle um, I wanted to use for time series as well. So let's look at how this works. So we'll start in a new cell in the bottom here, and we'll start by defining a time series model class. And this is going to be our base class for every other time series model in our, in our modeling framework. And there's a couple of things that this is going to need. Uh, first of all, we need a way to, to add time series together, and we're going to need a way to multiply time series together. And basically, when we add two time series together, what we're going to do is we're going to return an additive time series object. Um, with the left side self and the right side other. And you can guess what we're gonna do in the multiplicative time series um, because we're gonna return a multiplicative, multiplicative time series of self and other. And we'll implement those later. Um, 
And then the main thing that we're up that we're gonna have to do on this time series model is of course fit it on some kind of data. So we we'll say self um, x and y. That's what we're gonna fit on. And what we're gonna do first is define or start with making a model object. And what we then wanna do is basically delegate how this model fitting works to um, basically the individualized, the specialized subclasses. And what I'm gonna do for that is I'm going to say, I'm gonna make a prediction and my prediction is basically uh, my own definition uh, with my model X and Y. And the self titled definition thing or this definition method is actually where we're gonna add um, the logic of how the component actually fits on the data. So our time series model as a whole doesn't have a definition, like our time series model base class, because it's not really, like it's not really a model that you, that you should instantiate yourself because it doesn't really add anything. It's just there as a wrapper of basic functionality. What we can do in here though, is basically do the actual sampling based on these predictions from our subcomponents. So we can open our model context and once again, estimate this error term with the half Cauchy distribution, uh, error 0 0.5, and then have our observations, which were normally distributed um, around our prediction with standard deviation error and our observed data is Y. Then we can make a trace, store that on self so that we can reuse it later on when we want to introspect our model or use it to make predictions. Ah, uh, you know what, let's make this sample quarks and actually add them to, uh, no, not there, sorry, uh, to there, sample quarks. Right, and our time series model, um, right, so now, now we can go and uh, implement, for example, also the additive time series, uh, which subclasses from time series model. And when we initialize that, we do that with a left and a right part. And the only thing we actually need to do at this point is store those on self. The other thing that these, um, these individual nodes need is this definition. So the additive time series does need this definition with model X and Y. And the main thing that it's gonna return is the definition of its left side of model X and Y plus the definition of its right side model X and Y. You can already see probably that the multiplicative time series is gonna look very similar. So let's just copy paste that one. Multiplicative time series. Except that right here we need a, um, a multiplication sign rather than a, than a plus sign. Right, so now onto our actual linear trend, which is also a time series model. Um, when we initialize this, we mostly want to pass it its hyperparameters, so the amount of change points. Let's put that to 10 by default. Um, and we store those on self as well. This one, of course, also needs a definition, which takes self, model, x, and y. And I'm gonna assume that in this x, so this x is our entire data frame, so in this x data frame, we'll have a column t that actually contains our time. And we can use this time to make our change points. So that was, once again, this lin space between zero and the max of t uh, with self dot n change points plus two amount of change points so that we can grab the nicely distributed ones in the middle. And we can make this big indicator matrix here as well. So when t is bigger than s times one. And what we can do now is we can reopen this pass through model context and we can actually basically copy paste in our model from above. So we had our prior distributions over our parameters. Uh, for K, we have that for M, 
zero five. We have it for delta, which was our Laplacian delta zero zero point one with a shape equal self of any change points. Um, and then we had something like offset being equal to um, m plus tt dot dot uh, a n minus s times delta. And we had our growth, which was equal to k plus tt dot dot a and delta. And then our total trend was our growth times t plus our offset. And in the end, all we do is we return this, return this trend. And in the same way, we'll write our Fourier seasonality. Fourier seasonality time series inherits from time series model and inside it's in it. Um, we pass the periodicity and the number of components that we want this component to have. And we again make a definition, self model X and Y, grab T out of X so we can use it later on. And in terms of hyperparameters, we, we had that X helper function, but we can just reuse that so we can reopen our model context, make a parameter vector beta, which was normally distributed beta zero one shape equals self dot n times two. And then our seasonality actually becomes our tt dot dot between x of t, um, our shaped, our, our scaled time and the number of components multiplied with beta. And we can return the seasonality afterwards. Um, right, ah, I'm missing a comma there. New, something else? Ah, missing a comma there too. Sure. And the nice thing that we can now do is say that we have a model which is a linear trend plus a Fourier seasonality. Uh, and this one does need parameters. Ah, sorry, three. And we can also call fit on this model um with our timestamp column from our data frame sorry df not x and our value column pm dot model p where was that right let me see what did i do wrong here Oh, right, this X function, right, let's copy it on. That's a bit of a, like this X function uh, referred to the data frame that I passed in rather than the um, the thing that I actually needed. So let's, let's copy paste uh, that one in. All oh, right, there's a typo here. This needs to be X and then everything should be fine. Yeah, there we go, right? So, our actual model didn't really change from the one that we had above, but our API changed very heavily, right? Because now we can just add different types of components. And as long as those components have a definition on them, we can use them in the fitting process. And that gives us a much nicer way to extend this to different types of uh, components, but also to, um, let's say multiple time series. And making this work now on multiple series at a time is actually not that bad. Um, what I'll start with is I'll, I'll copy paste in some uh, a helper function called get group definition. And what this will do is given a certain column in our data frame, it will give back like which group, uh, like which groups are in my data set and which group is each uh, individual observation a part of. And what we can then do, for example, in our linear trend here is say, well, we have um, groups and we have a number of groups and that is from this get group definition. And we need to tell this get group definition what, what data should it look for and also what column should it use to define what a group is. And 
we're gonna put that on a variable called self dot pool calls, which will add in the init here. Self dot pool calls is none. Oh wait, not self dot pool calls. Self dot pool calls. Pool calls. And what we can then use this for is to basically add some more shapes to our parameters. Because rather than estimating a single K and a single M, we now want to add, uh, to estimate um, N groups Ks and N groups Ms. And for our Delta, we don't want to just estimate a, uh, a vector of self dot N change points of size self dot N change points. But this needs to be a matrix of N groups by self dot N change points. And what we can now use is PyMC's like, bracket notation to index into specific values, like specific draws for each individual observation. And that's what we use the groups for. So rather than using just M and using just K, we'll use M groups and K groups. And the same thing here for Delta. This dot product won't work in the same way anymore. So we're gonna have to rewrite it slightly build sort of our own and we'll use pm.math.sum for this. So we'll do a times this over um, there, x is equals one. And we'll do the same thing here. A times delta over x is equals one. And the rest of this can stay the same. For Fourier seasonality, we'll do very much the same thing. So we'll add our pool calls here. Pool calls equals none. We use the same group definition. Um, we'll make sure to change up beta. So it's going to be n groups by self dot n times two. And this dot product once again needs to change into pm dot math dot sum over this times beta over x is one. And if we now load our entire data set, basically what we can do is say, well, we want to estimate our linear trend, but it should be uh, pooled over series column. So rather than just estimating a single variant of this, please pool it over those columns. And the results of that will look something like this. So, these are all our series fitted completely independently of each other, but they are fitted in, in one model run. So what we see is that the blue and the red series, they fit like, actually quite, quite well. Uh, we see a clear yearly seasonality. We see some weekly seasonality. Um, and the gray one actually also fits reasonably well, but especially the green and the, and the yellow one here near the end, they do some weird things. Because the Fourier seasonality, like this Fourier series gives a lot of flexibility, this just happens to fit the data best. But like if we think about this problem more broadly, um, what we actually kind of want to be able to say is that the seasonality of the green and the orange or the yellow series should probably follow the other seasonalities as well, because it feels odd to assume that um, this suddenly will have a very different seasonality pattern from the other series. And it makes a lot of sense that this happens because our model kind of has amnesia at the moment, right? Our model just assumes that all these seasonalities are completely different. So both our, our yearly seasonality and our weekly seasonality, there's no shared information between, um, between the different series. So we need to cure our models from from amnesia. And this is where Bayesian models shine, right? Because we we all have, like we, we know that the power of, of Bayesian modeling very often is in this hierarchical estimation of parameters and this pooling. Um, and that pooling, we kind of want to add to our, like these partially pooled estimates of our parameters is kind of what we want to add to time series as well. And that's actually the entire reason why I started time series in the first place. So let's see how we can change our model up to allow this hierarchical fitting of parameters. Um, this groups, this, this get group definition is actually already kind of prepared for this. So what we can do is we can add the pooling type that we want to use 
for our individual components here as well. We add pool type. Default is complete, so we just make it, we, we act like it's only a single time series that we're fitting at a time. Um, self the pool type, and we need to add that to our get group definition as well. Self the pool type. And basically what we're gonna do here is inside our model say, well, if the pooling type um, is partial, so if we want hierarchical estimation of our parameters, we're gonna use a different formulation than if it's not hierarchical. And I'm kinda gonna say here that, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add so we need a different way of estimating K, M, and Delta. And what we're gonna say is that we're gonna estimate, um, we're gonna assume they're centered around zero still. So we're gonna estimate a Sigma K, which is a half Cauchy distribution uh, with beta one. Uh, we're gonna estimate an offset K, which is a normal distribution. Uh, centered around zero with a standard deviation of one. And we're gonna estimate one of these offsets for each individual um, group, for each individual series that we want to have an estimate for. So what we're doing here is we're saying we have a global idea of what K should be, and then each individual series is allowed to deviate from it with a certain offset. And then the actual K for a group is deterministic um, because it's basically sigma K times offset k. And we can repeat this exact same thing for m. So we make a sigma m is also half Cauchy. Um, between 0 and 5. Sorry, with, uh, with beta 5. Sigma m beta 5. We have an offset for m, which is normally distributed offset m01. One. Once again here, of shape equals n groups. And our actual m is once again deterministic. Um, and it's sigma m times offset m. The reason why the original k's and m's are normal and these are half Cauchy, so the, these are only strictly positive, is because the offset can be negative. And what I didn't want was um, to have a sort of symmetry where either all the sigmas are positive and then the offsets are negative and vice versa, because it makes the sampling process much harder because you get these very distinct modes of your sampler and, and that doesn't really work great. We're gonna do the same thing for delta. So we have a sigma delta, half Cauchy, sigma delta, um, kind of a small beta again. We have an offset delta, um, pm dot normal, whoops, offset delta zero one. And the shape of this thing is n groups by n change points. And our delta is once again deterministic. Um, sigma delta times offset delta, right? And whichever path we took down this if else tree, we're gonna have a K and M and a delta, which has shape N groups or N groups by N change points. So this part of our formulation can stay exactly the same. And in our Fourier seasonality, we end up doing the same thing. So if our pool type is partial pooling, we're gonna need a slightly different if, different definition than if it's not. So uh, we have a mu beta, PM normal. So here I don't assume that the betas are centered around zero, where I assumed here that sigma, or that the k's, the m's, and the deltas were centered around zero. Um, so that's why I also estimate a, a, me, a global mean for the beta, whereas I didn't do that for k, m, and delta there. Um, so that's zero one distributed 
uh, the shape is self dot n by two, um, right? Because each change point has its own uh, its own beta. Um, sigma beta is needs to be positive because it's a, a standard deviation, so it's a half normal. Sigma beta kind of small, also shape self dot n times two. And then the offset beta is normally distributed uh, 0, 1 with a shape of n groups. Shape equals n groups by self dot n times 2. And the actual beta is once again deterministic. Beta mu beta plus offset beta times sigma beta. So this is where that mu beta comes in again to, to make sure that it's not necessarily centered around um, centered around zero. The seasonality we bring we bring out of it so that we can nicely follow one of this is elf if else paths, but reuse the same formulation for the actual seasonality. Right. Um, one other thing that we want to add here. Um, this is a bit of a um, a subtle one. But what we saw in our actual result before was that we also had a um, seasonality, uh, a weekly seasonality component. But if we do it like this, it won't actually work because both these Fourier seasonality components will try to add parameters with the same names to our models. So what we're going to have to do is give individual names somehow to these, um, to these components. And the cool thing, cool thing that I recently actually found out, it's not even in time series yet, is that you can have parent models. So we can give a, a model a new name and then make it inherit from a parent model and then sort of a sub model inside a, a bigger PyMC model. And it does that prefixing of names with this, uh, this prefixing of the parameter names, um, it does it for you. And I found this to be quite an elegant solution to this, uh, to this problem. So what we're going to say here is that we're going to prefix it with like the specific Fourier seasonality component. Um, so self dot n and self dot p, and that's what we're going to prefix everything with. And let's also just for completeness sake do this for our linear trend here, but then with the number of change points. Fitting this actually takes quite a bit of time. It's not super slow, but it's definitely not fast either. So let's just go to the results of this. Because the actual model that I ended up building for this data set using time series looked like this. So we have a, a model, it's called a partial pooled model here. And it consists of a number of components. First of all, a linear trend component with 10 change points, and then two types of seasonalities. One, which is just an additive uh, weekly seasonality, so it's um, period is time delta days equals seven, and it's partially pulled on the series, meaning each series can have their own weekly seasonality, um, but I assume it to be drawn from a globally shared distribution. Our yearly seasonality is slightly different though, because what I did there was say, well, we have one seasonality, um, which is also partial pulled, and then to account for the co and contra seasonal effect, I estimate a constant for each series. And that constant can be between minus one and one. So I multiply that constant by our Fourier seasonality to basically have the same seasonality, but then flipped. And when we look at the result of this model with the same data, um, with the same complexity, we suddenly see that especially our orange or our yellow and our green series fit much more, um, much more elegantly, I would say, because you very, you, you strongly see the effect of this shrinkage and this like, oh, wait, I, I, the model now actually sees that there is just one seasonality over all our series. And especially like when we compare it to our previous result, we don't have any of these like higher order Fourier artifacts anymore. And I would be much more confident in using the, the upper model to make predictions 
for a long-term situation rather than the lower. Also, if we look at the individual components, we see that everything just somehow falls together much more clearly, right? Our yearly seasonality definitely follows the same pattern. And of course, there's slight deviations for each series because we allowed for that. And the same thing for our weekly seasonality, um, even though they are slightly different, like the overall pattern of having higher values on day two and three and lower values on four and five is now clearly shown in each of the individual series. Our summer products are all contra seasonal to the seasonality that we estimated while our winter products are seasonal. That's also a nice sanity check to say, ah, it probably learned something reasonable. And all of this was possible because of this, like this quite elegant API, if I may say myself, so myself, um, where we just multiply different components together. And actually adding this constant component was super easy as well, because we just added um, a class constant with some hyperparameters and a definition where that definition just says, well, estimate one parameter in these range. It's just uniform. And that's, that's the nice thing about this entire project, I think. For me, it brings back a lot of the playfulness in time series modeling. Because if you now have an idea like, oh, I want to actually estimate these things together or separate, you can actually start going back to modeling rather than chugging it into some kind of black boxy thing and hoping that the reasonable thing comes out. Um, that said, time series is nowhere near done. All of the code that you've seen today is open source. It's on my GitHub. Um, and while it works, I wouldn't say that it's production ready yet. I expect the API to, to still change at least a couple of times, especially around making predictions, because that part, it doesn't really work all that well yet. Um, and then apart from that, there's like a lot of other things that we, that I need to do, like adding tests, um, adding different kind of basis functions for seasonality, uh, adding the other types of growths, um, like the uncertainty in forecasting or other types of regressors. Uh, but also like a very big one is uh, non-constant variance. Like I would really like to be able to say that, that variance might be bigger in certain times of the year, or maybe there's a trend in variance changes over time. Um, but I haven't found a good way to actually add that to the API just yet. So that needs to wait until someone comes up with a, with a good idea on how to add that. Um, thanks for attending. If you are interested in um, learning more about time series, as I said, it's on my GitHub. If you want to know more, uh, please come to the uh, later scheduled uh, fireside chat. Um, and I hope to uh, I hope you enjoyed it.